Hello, and welcome to the third and final webinar in our series called Infra OS, Discovering the Art of the Possible. Joining us on today's webinar are David Zeman, a channel account manager with Infra based in Prague. James Harbage, an Infra senior technical solution consultant based in the UK. And Kane McConnell, the managing director of LLP Technology in Luxembourg, a part of LLP Group. For those of you who have been with us for the previous two webinars of this series, welcome back. We hope you've enjoyed the previous sessions. And hope you'll find this session informative as well. I'll now turn it over to Kane McConnell for today's session. In for OS, integrations made simple. Let me start actually by introducing uh, LLP Group for those on the call that uh, might not be familiar with us. Uh, LLP Group has been around for about 25 years, a little more than 25 years, as a multinational consultancy and, and a systems integrator. Um, we've also released a few SaaS products of our own. And uh, as David mentioned, we're an Infor Global Alliance partner and uh, Infor Gold Channel partner. Uh, in the last couple of years, we recognized a real need to uh, build and consolidate a group within our organization of technical consultants to focus on the core Infor platform, Infor OS, and um, as well as extend our capabilities into integrating uh, customer and third-party systems with, with Infor solutions. So we formed LLP Technology, which is now the 10th company in LLP Group. Uh, our main office is in Luxembourg. We have a distributed team of technicians and developers and solution architects uh, throughout Luxembourg, UK, and Hungary, uh, and have plans to ramp up additional staffing uh, over the next year. In addition to focusing on the technical aspects of Infor implementations, we regularly partner with Infor um, to develop new connectors, accelerators, and uh, integrations with third-party platforms to satisfy needs across a particular industry. So for example, we're just beginning a project focused on tailoring Infor's Cloud Suite EAM with a focus on fleet management. We're also developing a new RESTful interface for Sun Systems Connect, which will allow Sun Systems to work with other RESTful endpoints like Coleman, Data Lake, Mongoose, uh, as well as any third-party systems that utilize REST APIs. Because of our alliance with Infor, our, our uh, own experience and our reputation with our customers, we also identified a second need to extend our technical support services to a more comprehensive managed services practice. So that's a new part of LLP technology as well. So now that you know who we are, let me take a second to introduce myself as well. Uh, I came to LLP Group about a year ago after many years of working in multiple industries and about the last six of those years in executive management so I played a key role in the formation of LLP technology as a partner, and I'm now the managing director. Uh, in the last 30 years of coming up through different roles and industries, I've witnessed tons of technological innovations, as, as we all have. Uh, keep in mind, the web browser didn't exist until 1990. Um, so uh, speaking of which, does anybody remember the name of the first web browser. Let's put that question up and see uh, see if your brains are working yet this morning. Give you a few moments to uh, get your answers in. While we do that, you know, when we think about where we were with business technology just 30 years ago and think about where we are today and the capabilities of a platform like InfoOS, it's amazing to consider the pace at which we're able to innovate. You know, today we're no longer looking for ways to read textual layouts on screens. We're leveraging technologies like machine learning and robotic process automation and predictive analy analytics and IoT and things like that. And the pace of innovation is getting even faster and the pace itself is becoming even more critical for businesses. 
Now let's get back to our question. The name of the first web browser, let's see how you did. Pretty, pretty even distribution there between, uh, a lot of you think Netscape Navigator. The first web browser actually was World Wide Web. Uh, it was developed in 1990 for the next computer at the same time that the first web server uh, was ever built and then later introduced at CERN in March 1991. So um, that's a tricky question there. So I mentioned the pace of innovation and how the pace itself is becoming even more critical for businesses. At the World Government Summit in 2015, Klaus Schwab gave the opening day speech saying that we're no longer in the age of capitalism. It's no longer access to capital or natural resources that drive competitiveness, but talents and innovation that are creating a tsunami of change in industry. Go-to-market strategies have to be keen. They have to be quickly executed. It's no longer about being the biggest fish, but about being the fastest fish. And without getting too deep into theories of hydrodynamic propulsion, what does it take to be a fast fish? Well, we need elasticity and we need agility. These are two critical characteristics found in some of the fastest fish in the ocean, like the sailfish, known to clock speeds at 110 kilometers an hour. Now, in the previous sessions with James, we looked at how InfoOS and Cloud Suites are built on Amazon Web Services, which provide tremendous elasticity to the platform, giving the ability to instantly and infinitely scale to the demands of your workloads. And today we'll see the agility of the platform. What exactly can we do with all the tools and components of InfoOS? Even, even more importantly, we'll see how to turn complexity into simplicity by shifting systems and processes to InfoOS. Now, why do we care about complexity? As Richard Branson is known to say, complexity is your enemy. Your, your business may have built up complexity over time, possibly inheriting bloat and inefficiencies from legacy systems or uh, outdated processes, aging infrastructure. You've got disparate systems, which means information required to form data-driven decisions is scattered across the enterprise. Even Evolving regulations and, and geographic expansions can in, impose complexity to your business as well. Well, if innovation is the new driver behind competitiveness, requiring speed and agility to be the fastest innovating fish, if you'll pardon the analogy, then simplicity is critical to our mission because simplicity is the key to speed, agility, and innovation. So my goal today is to show some practical, real-world examples of how you can bring your entire enterprise onto InfoOS, leveraging all the elasticity and agility of the platform, and do it in a way that keeps things simple. Now, specifically today, as David mentioned, we're, we're focused on integrating with InfoOS, bringing your line of business systems online with InfoOS. Uh, we've spent the past two sessions talking about the architecture and the capabilities of the platform. And I encourage you to go back to those sessions if you missed them and, and review everything James has introduced so far. I'd also encourage you to head to YouTube and type InfoOS in the search. It'll take you right to the new InfoOS channel. And make sure you start by clicking the subscribe button when you get there. Info releases new content there, um, including video tutorials uh, nearly every week. Okay, so we've, we've got to take all the complexities of your business in your industry, all of your line of business systems, 
all of the Enforce software you're working with, integrate it all together into one platform so your business can become the fastest fish. How do we do that? First, we start with a core business process catalog specific to your industry. We generally aim to cover at least 60% of business requirements with implementation accelerators and, and out of the box functionality. And of course, we know that not all businesses are the same. You have unique processes that set you apart in your market, maybe even make you the leader in your segment. When you in onboard with Infor as a customer, there's a, a very clever process we go through to identify how much of the core functionality satisfies your business requirements out of the box versus what might need to be tweaked or configured for your specific, specific needs. Then we find that generally about 30% of your processes will require a bit of configuration and fine tuning. Uh, this configuration band is also where most of the integrations happen because in 4 os provides incredible agility to easily integrate and interface with external systems and of course any N4 applications. Then we find that about 10% of your current processes are truly unique to you. Uh, these are high value processes to you that give you your edge so you, you don't adopt uh, or shouldn't adopt an out of the box process but really need something specific. Uh, in some cases, some of your interfaces might exist in this space for homegrown systems, non-standard uh, communication protocols, or maybe some development that's required. Um, and this is where we really leverage the extensibility uh, of the platform. This is also why uh, utilizing trained in for partners like LLP Group is, is such an important part of the process for many customers. Um, much of the platform is built to be intuitive, and there's plenty of room for do-it-yourself tasks, even in a large rollout. But the idea is to keep things simple for your business so you can focus on your business. We have an entire business unit at LOP Group dedicated to InfoOS, particularly making the configuration uh, changes identified in that 30% band walking customers through the process of identifying adoption versus configuration uh, versus extension and making sure that your time to value is as short as possible. When we get into that 10% band of extending the platform, we have the skills and talent on our team to execute. Uh, in, in fact, some of my staff were directly involved in developing some of the applications we see today and as I mentioned previously, we're involved now in developing some of the implementation accelerators that support that 60% core functionality. So the examples we'll see today are real world examples of work we've performed to bring customers onto the platform. Many of them are just glimpses of much larger projects. So I've tried to hone in on some of the aspects that generate the most questions in my inbox and um, we certainly won't get to all the possibilities of the platform today, but hopefully we'll stir your imagination as to what's possible and what you can achieve by shifting and lifting your processes to the N4OS platform and any of the N4 cloud suites or applications that you might be considering. So our first example is from a large multinational organization in the aviation industry uh, that provides much of the ground support equipment and vehicles that you see at airports. Um, this particular project involved their fleet management division. Uh, they needed to get, or they needed to integrate their uh, on-prem proprietary telematics system to share uh, equipment status, condition, uh, position uh, with Cloud Suite EAM. So in this case, a third-party company was responsible for building uh, a RESTful API service for their on-prem system. And uh, there was very limited documentation. The functionality of the API was still in development when we came into the project. Now, 
in most cases, this type of interface is pretty standard and requires minimal configuration. And in this particular case, we did have to create a custom Swagger file to match the functionality of the API as the third party wasn't able to provide one. So let's talk about Swagger files as we dive in to see how we completed this task. As I mentioned, the, the first step in configuration was to add an external API to the ION API gateway so that ION knows how to interact with the external system. And most of the RESTful APIs used by enterprises uh, include a Swagger file, but if you're not familiar with Swagger files, there's great information at swagger.io. But simply put, all the functionality of an API service can be included in a single Swagger file, which can be read by machines and humans to surface the capabilities of the service and, and requirements for making requests and receiving responses. So here we are on the ION API gateway screen, and we can see that there are already some APIs configured for uh, some of the Enforce services included in our environment. Uh, in this case, we want to add a new one, so we just click the first tile. Now, some folks may have skipped through this screen a bit quickly in the past and gone straight through to creating a new API. After all, that's, I mean, that's what we're here to do as well. So uh, I want to point out what else we're seeing on this screen. Um, these other API suites that are available to uh, add to our environment, many of them are related to other N4 services that maybe this customer hasn't purchased. But some are actually third-party connections built right into N4 OS. And I think it's worth mentioning some of the major ones that are that are here. Uh, so, for example, you'll find an API suite for DocuSign, Marketo, Salesforce, ServiceNow, ShipEngine, and, and several others. But in our case, we need to add a customer's API suite that isn't here. So we click on the top tile to create a new one. This brings us into the setup view where we can add the details of our new API suite. We add a name of our choosing, and we add the other details here as well. Um, we are a bit limited on time today, so we won't go field by field through this, but you can find detailed configuration guidance on the Info documentation link shown here as well. Once we save the basic information, we can add one or more endpoints. And when you add an endpoint, you'll see an icon in the documentation column and uh, this is where we're going to add the documentation, and in our case, uh, the Swagger file. So I've pulled up an example of what you see when you click into the documentation link from the target endpoint of an API suite. Uh, we see all the resources available in this suite, a description of, of how they can be used and the request method. Um, clicking any one of these resources will let us drill down into more documentation about that particular resource. So I've already clicked into one of the resources available, and we can see here that I could actually provide some values in the fields and make a test call uh, to make sure the API suite works and is connected properly, as well as to make sure I understand how to use this particular resource what the response looks like, and so on. So we've completed the first step already. We've added a new API suite to the ION API gateway and uploaded a Swagger file so that ION and we know how to use the API. Our next step will be to include our new API suite as a connection point in ION. Uh, in our case, we're going to add a new connection point, and I'm going to skip over the connection tab at the top of this view for now. Again, we've got a link here to the documentation that will walk you through this process in detail, but it's really quite simple in our case. We use something called a service account, which we've set up in user management, and we simply upload a file containing the details of that service account on the connection tab. What I want to highlight here is the documents tab, which is already selected for us. It's in this area that we can add uh, scheduled actions for ION to take with the API suite. 
So we can get information from the API, we can send information to the API, or we can even perform sort of a two-step process of sending information to the API and receiving back a response of something that we can use in a data flow. So in our case, we wanna get the latest telematics from the customer's on-prem system and bring that information into Cloud Suite EAM. So we use the get from API option in this case, and, and we can select from the available API suites and resources. Again, that information is coming from the Swagger file. So you can see why that file is, is important and how it's used throughout ION. Now, I've included a couple snapshots of the subsequent tabs on the right side of the slide. And in this case, we're sending a JSON body as the request, and then we're getting back a JSON response from the customer system. Now, that's a little bit technical, but um, it, it's really sort of the normal way that APIs, modern APIs work. So ION converts the API response into a BOD or a business object document, uh, which we've specified the name here. And we can set this to repeat on any schedule that we, that we set up, for example, every four hours. So what happens when it runs and we get our response back from the customer system? Where does that information go? Under the hood of ION, there is an enterprise messaging service, and it's this service that provides so much elasticity and agility to the platform and gives us a, a loosely coupled architecture in which we can easily link up systems, even if each of those systems knows nothing about the other. Um, and we could get quite technical here, but for now, we just need to know that every time the task executes according to the schedule that we just configured in our connection point, the resulting document will be published to ION. And we use a data flow, uh, as we see here, to orchestrate where that document goes. So in our data flow, which you can see is quite simple, we've uh, configured ION to look for messages coming from the ION API that are of the document type that we're looking for. And we route that to a mapping process, which I'll explain in a minute. And the output of that mapping process is sent to N4EAM. So let's pause and review what we've just done. We added a customer's API suite to the API gateway by uploading a Swagger file. And we configured a connection point in ION to our API suite so that ION can use the API with a service account connection. In the connection point, we added a scheduled-based uh, task to get information from the customer's API. And then we've configured a simple data flow to instruct ION on how to handle and where to route the response we get back from the customer's API. So in this case, we're getting things like GPS position, engine hours, um, other meter readings from the equipment. And within just a few minutes of configuration, we've linked the customer's on-prem telematic system to Cloud Suite EAM so that all the wonders and magic of EAM can leverage that data. Now I skipped over the mapping in the middle, and let me show you that now. ION has the ability to map between two different business object documents or BODs. Essentially, we need the, the information coming in from the customer's API, which was built by a third party to be transformed into a proper Cloud Suite EAM document so that EAM knows what to do with it. And for that, we can configure a mapping either by using the, the graphical mapper like we see in the main image here, um, using click and drop functionality, meaning we don't need to write any code, or we can switch into the XSLT editor if more advanced transformation is needed, or for, you know, for example, if we already have an XSLT file, um, and an example there is, is on the image to the right. We can also uh, test the mapping by um, providing, in our case, the incoming information from the customer's API to be sure we've got the mapping configured correctly 
before enabling it to be used in active data flows. So this type of process is typical for Cloud Suite EAM customers. And, and while in this case, we did have to create our own Swagger file, the rest of the setup involved just a few configuration steps and no code. All right, so that's our first scenario. I want to pause here and just take a look at the incoming questions and uh, and see what we've got coming into the inbox. And just as a reminder, if you have questions as we go along, um, definitely send those in. And we're going to try today to get as many of them answered as possible. This is a great question about um, the source of the breakdown of the 603010. And really, when you look at the size of or the number of customers that Infor has in, in all of the industries that are covered by Infor applications, um, there's a lot of you know, aggregated information and, and science behind uh, really working with uh, those customers and subject matter experts to identify the amount of functionality that is common among businesses in a certain industry. And generally what's found is that about that, um, you know, as I said, the 60% mark, most businesses and most business processes can be covered by out of the box functionality or, or um, functionality that is, is common to that industry. And then, uh, you know, the 30% being things that vary, um, but are quite similar, so they're just configuration changes. But uh, those numbers are really benchmarked out of Enforce history uh, with its customers. That's a, that's a really great question. Thanks for that. All right, we've got more questions coming in. We're going to have a few more opportunities uh, to jump into those. For our next real-world example, We'll stay with the same customer, but the scenario will be a bit different um, as there's a bit of code involved, but we'll see that the process is still quite simple. So the customer wanted to integrate Cloud Suite EAM with their suppliers so that when a purchase order uh, is created in EAM, it's automatically sent to the supplier. Um, when the supplier generates an invoice in their system, it's automatically sent back to EAM. And all of this is managed through in 4 os We refer to standard communication protocols quite a bit when discussing in 4 os And there are truly many ways that in 4 os can connect with external systems. But in this case, the supplier system utilizes a lesser known format called CXML. A CXML evolved out of EDI in the late 90s and is, is useful um, in e-commerce and procurement systems. Uh, the important thing to note, though, is that it is a different document type from standard XML. But just because an external system uses a legacy or a lesser known protocol doesn't mean that it can't be integrated with InfoOS and other Info applications. Now, much of this integration would uh, be the same as we just saw. So we won't go through the step-by-step -step again, but let's look at uh, some differences in the data flow. So in the previous scenario, remember the data flow had just three steps. We receive the information from the API, it goes through a mapping process, and then into Cloud Suite EAM. There are two key differences to point out in our purchase order scenario. One is the fact that information is flowing a different direction, meaning you know this data flow is watching for a purchase order to be published from Cloud Suite EAM in order to send it to the API gateway and, and out to the supplier's procurement system. So the second key difference is that instead of using the graphical mapper, which won't give us the uh, required CXML format, we use the ION scripting module to transform our Cloud Suite EAM purchase order 
into a CXML document as required by the supplier. And then we send that CXML document through the API gateway to the supplier. There's also an additional tool uh, used in this data flow. When the, when the purchase order is published from Cloud Suite EAM, we use a filter to check to see if the supplier is the supplier we're looking for in this particular data flow. And if it's not a matching supplier, then we end the process. Uh, if the supplier is the one that we set this data flow up for, then the process continues into the subsequent steps. So as you can see across the row of icons at the top, we have many tools and utilities we can use in a data flow. And data flows are very flexible, so they can be used to orchestrate your data throughout your enterprise to remove the worry and the burden of trying to manually share information and, and sharing it consistently. And this is one of the key capabilities that uh, allows us to take what traditionally could be a complex integration and boil it down into a, a tidy diagram with a few configuration steps. So let's talk about this middle step where we're using scripting. The scripting component in ION is a fairly recent addition to uh, N4OS Cloud Edition and available in all cloud suites, and it's really powerful. Uh, you can include Python scripts in your data flows to perform transformations or enrichments that are a, a bit beyond the scope of the graphical mapper or even the XSLT editor. And in fact, uh, in, in most cases, if the choice is between writing a Python script or an uh, XSLT script, my team is going to choose Python. And one of the main reasons behind that is you can upload Python libraries and use those libraries with your script. So this integration took a little more effort. We made a couple configuration changes in Cloud Suite EAM to make sure all the information we needed to send to the supplier was included in the purchase order when it was uh, published to ION. And then my team wrote the script to transform the XML purchase order from EAM into a CXML document uh, in the required format according to the supplier. Now, because we focus so heavily on N4OS at LLP technology and we, we uh, work so much with integrations like this, we're continuously building a library of assets and implementation accelerators that shorten these processes and, and keep the time to value as short as possible for our customers and for Enforce customers. Uh, this type of scenario is something that, that we can implement again and again quite quickly because we have the digital assets in our, in our library. Uh, if this were a more widely used procurement system in the market, then We'd add this to the business process catalog for Cloud Suite EAM as a implementation accelerator to make it even more plug and play. And that's really one of the key roles of my team and for LLP Group as a uh, Infor Global Alliance partner. So coming back to our customer and our, our scenario, we've got the purchase order now automatically going to the supplier when it's created in Cloud Suite EAM. The other half of this task was receiving back an invoice from the supplier in response to our purchase order. So in this case, the supplier didn't have any existing way to send the invoice back to N4OS using any of the built-in mechanisms. No matter which method we chose, it was going to require development on the supplier's end. So that's not quite as common of a scenario, especially dealing with large enterprises, but it, it was the case for this customer's supplier. And we had a chat with the supplier's technical team, gave them a little bit of training, and we provided an overview of the various um, connection methods available in N4OS. And in that conversation, the supplier felt they could most quickly implement delivery of the invoice using uh, the N4 application connector. Now, there, there's really two types of application connectors or two flavors of it, we'll say. One requires a set of inbox and outbox tables uh, to be installed in a remote database uh, if, the, if the system is uh, you know, using a database. 
and the other utilizes uh, IMS over ION API. Uh, we don't have to get too technical here because as, as far as the supplier is concerned, we're just making a uh, API method available to them so they can send an invoice to ION. But we can take a look at the available APIs in ION. So I've gone back into ION API and clicked into the uh, Infor ION API suite to see all the available target endpoints here. Um, there's a lot here, so we're just going to focus on the messaging service endpoint. And I'm going to click into the documentation link to see what we can do with this. So we see there are a few versions of the API available. Of course, for any new conf uh, configurations, we want to use the latest version. And we have a method available to send a message directly into ION. So what this meant uh, for this uh, scenario was that the supplier could configure their system to send a Cloud Suite EAM supplier invoice uh, directly into ION through the ION API, just like any other application connected to the platform. So we provided the necessary information, uh, as I said, to the supplier's technical team so that they knew how to submit the invoice through ION API and then set up a data, uh, data flow to uh, direct the invoice into Cloud Suite EAM. Now we see a couple more capabilities of data flows here. When an invoice arrives, we have the main invoice information and, and then we have any number of items included. Uh, so for Cloud Suite EAM, we need to treat the invoice and the items a bit separately, even though um, you know, there is a relationship that exists between the items and the invoice. So we use the parallel tool to create branches in the data flow, and each branch runs simultaneously. Uh, on the upper branch, nothing needs to be done with the, with the supplier invoice other than to send it to Cloud Suite EAM because the supplier is already sending it in the proper format. And on the lower branch, we see another tool used uh, the splitter as the second step on that branch. And the invoice items are, are split and each item is sent separately to uh, Cloud Suite EAM, which is how EAM needs them to arrive. So we've seen yet another way to easily and quickly integrate external systems within 4OS. And we've seen a few more elements of ION like um, using IMS via ION API uh, to receive messages directly into ION. Um, we use scripting where we can upload and use uh, the Python libraries and scripts and uh, running parallel branches and splitting items into data flows. What's more, we've made the customer very happy as their procurement staff no longer need to uh, exchange emails with the supplier and wait for responses. They simply create the purchase order in Cloud Suite EAM, and the corresponding invoice is automatically sent back to EAM from the supplier. All right, let's check back in with the Q&A box and see what we've got coming in. So this is a question, are there any limitations to ION integrations uh, in the cloud versus on-premise? Um, there are some difference in features. I would say that um, the cloud is always going to be the best way to go uh, because some of the newer capabilities, um, we won't look at API flows today, but those are brand new. Um, the Python scripting, some of those capabilities are only in the cloud. And then when you look at Coleman and digital or digital uh, data lake, um, you know, Mongoose, all of the other things that that the benefits of OS, those are going to be in the cloud. So, yeah, there are some differences. The most capable being uh, going to be in the cloud edition. We've got some also really good um, technical questions coming in about specific uh, specific types of integrations or specific transformations and enrichments that you can do. 
Um, just know that all of these questions do get saved and we will follow up with you uh, after. But um, since some of them don't really apply to the whole audience, uh, we'll just keep those till the end of the meeting. All right, we'll have one more chance uh, at the end for questions, so keep those coming in. So our final example for today is, is going to break the mold a little bit, so to speak, and it's probably going to be quite interesting for some of you on the call today. Uh, the customer in this scenario is a company with a brand portfolio that covers multiple retail categories from uh, fashion to auto parts. Um, their brands are available through major retailers in North America and Europe, including um, Amazon and Walmart. And a significant portion of the sales for their flagship brand comes from the brand's website, where um, customers can buy aftermarket auto accessories. Uh, orders that are received through the website are actually shipped internationally. So they manage millions of SKUs for this brand, which is available for sale in almost every country for nearly every vehicle ever made since the 1960s. And most of the um, functions of the business are handled in-house, everything from product development, manufacturing and supply chain management, uh, wholesale and distribution, um, order fulfillment, customer engagement, uh, even their own software development, and, and that's kind of what I want to touch on. So over the past few years, they have really relied on their own in-house developers to build all of the systems they needed, staffing uh, at 1.40 developers uh, at the peak of their, their build-out. Now, why would they go through all that trouble and expense? Well, if you're not familiar with the auto accessories market, it can be really quite difficult because some parts need to fit the vehicle the buyer owns. And in the case of safety parts, which they also deal with, they're, they're subject to um, international safety regulations. And of course, they're in many, many countries. So those regulations can be quite complex. But the fitment process is extremely complex. And really, it's part of their secret sauce, fitting the the right part with the right vehicle. So I can't explain the fitment process, but I can explain why you might think this customer couldn't easily move to N4OS. And we're just gonna talk about the flagship brand and, and the auto parts. Each product has four dimensions that can be configured by the buyer. Um, they involve a type variation, a material variation, a size variation, and a color variation. So the customer enters their vehicle information and then they can configure the part based on those four dimensions. When you think of the number of vehicle manufacturers and models and submodels and trim levels for every year back to the 1960s for every country on the planet, then consider compounding that by four configurable dimensions, just imagine the size of, of the databases and the, and the computing power it takes to handle that much information. Well, online buyers don't wanna wait for your backend to search some massive database to get the product they want. So the company developed a proprietary fitment algorithm uh, based on the buyer's vehicle information. The buyer answers a few simple questions on the website about their vehicle and configures the product based on those four dimensions. And when the order arrives into their order management system, that fitment process kicks in and in less than a second, selects the SKU to send to the buyer. It's a, it's a really special process. Now, because they distribute their products and have, and have multiple uh, fulfillment centers all around the world, a, a fulfillment process takes over once those SKUs have been determined. Um, the fulfillment process uses the information it received from the fitment algorithm, and it considers all of the uh, available fulfillment routes serving that buyer's address. 
then it checks the real-time stock levels in that part of the fulfillment network, and it sends a fulfillment order to the optimal fulfillment center for that buyer. And again, this is an auto autonomous process that happens within seconds of receiving a new order. And within a few minutes, that selected fulfillment center sees the order um, and sees that it's ready to be packed and shipped to the buyer. So imagine uh, millions of SKUs, multi-dimensional configurable products, global distribution, large daily order volumes, and we're talking about um, just uh, the order fulfillment process for one of their brands. And you would think that the job is too big or it's too complex to move to N4, the number of integrations and, and configurations that have to happen. It would take forever, but it's not. In fact, when I introduced the customer to N4OS and, and N4 Cloud Suites, they instantly saw the potential. They instantly saw the art of the possible, if you will. Uh, consider all the effort and capital expense that they've incurred over the years, building their own systems, um, staffing teams of developers, IT infrastructure, and probably the highest cost, trial and error. Uh, it's enormous. So we worked together to plan an agile cloud transformation roadmap. The, the first phase of their transformation, which we're in now, uh, involves bringing all their disparate and disjointed systems together into N4OS. And this is where N4 Mingle becomes really important for them. We're able to provide single sign-on through N4OS, consolidate all their web interfaces into OS, and uh, use the social business capabilities of Mingle to begin introducing the platform to their users up front instead of waiting for some big bang go live at the end. Now, some of their systems have highly specific user interfaces, but um, we wanted to find a way to decrease the, the deltas between some of the N4 application screens and processes and what they're doing now. Um, so to do this, we're adapting their existing homegrown applications using .NET Core to connect them to and through ION using some of the techniques and methods we've seen in, in some of the previous examples today. And this is going to allow them to leverage features like document management, data flow, uh, data lake, API flows, workflows, and even in the future, Mongoose and Coleman, really the full capability of the platform. Um, we're specifically adapting their systems to use uh, standard business objects that can easily be used in N4OS and picked up by other N4 applications. And there are um, plenty of N4 applications on the roadmap. And as we shift and, and lift, each segment of their business into the cloud will be able to minimize the time to value because N4OS as their core enterprise platform makes that possible. And now that they've, I'm gonna say it again, now that they've seen the art of the possible, they're becoming a much faster fish. And the current roadmap is bringing them through the last upgrade they'll ever need. It's a really, really great testament to uh, to the capabilities and the ease of integration with with the platform within 4OS. Let's dive back in and see where we're at with questions. Yeah, there are there are some really good questions here. Um, there are specific, uh, as I mentioned before, there are specific questions about um, different types of BODs specific to uh, in for applications. It looks like we are getting those answers back to you. Um, and if we can't, we will follow up by email. Let me just flip through here. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back on that specific one. We've got a question on uh, 
before expense management. And I'll uh, I'll get back with an answer on that one shortly. Super. Here's a great question about um, something called the Enterprise Connector and how do you um, connect with on-premise applications uh, with in for cloud? Um, I'm going to flip back to this previous slide while I answer this because it's a classic example. Uh, so this customer has databases on-prem. Um, they actually have a hybrid. So uh, they are in multiple uh, clouds, um, uh, private clouds, and on-prem equipment. And any time that we want to connect, if we're going to use, um, I mentioned like the inbox outbox uh, type of connection with a database, we would use something called an enterprise connector for that. And that's a little application that sits on that remote database server and creates a secure tunnel back to N4 Cloud. So um, ultimately, it's you know, without diving too much in the in the technical side, it's really just like it's sitting in the cloud together, right? Just like a VPN connection or any kind of secure tunneling, and then you can use that connector within N4 Cloud to you know potentially send a, um, a bod or or a, yeah a bod to that database to a, a SQL procedure, for example do some processing within that database, and then use the outbox to send something back into ION. So um, that type of connection is very common. In fact, if um, for our Sun Systems customers, we do a lot of business with Sun Systems. Uh, when our Sun Systems are even in the Infor cloud, uh, Sun Systems is still a single tenant application. And so you'll see in your uh, InforOS an enterprise connector to Sun Systems, but other than seeing that connection is an enterprise connector connection, there's really no other uh, impact or, or complication from that. Let's see what else we have. Other integration platforms, that's another good question. So um, can we still use ION? Of course, ION uh, really, uh, I would say there's a half dozen, if you kind of group some things together, ways to connect uh, into ION. And in those half dozen, there are you know, uh, more specific ways. So there's there are a ton of ways to connect with ION. And anything that is, um, restful based database connectors, file shares. Um, I know I'm going to, I hate doing these lists by memory because I'm going to leave one out, but there's a bunch. And um, as long as that other platform uh, is using any one of those types of connections, then of course you can, um, you know, move information back and forth. It's just going to behave like any other uh, application. So that's a, that's another, um, Great question. We do see that where, you know, at some point a customer's made a decision to um, go to an application that may have some integration capabilities built into it. Um, now they are moving to uh, in for and they want to know how, you know, what that transition is going to look like. Um, it's really, really quite flexible. What else do we have? Um, yeah, we'll get back to those. I think there's a couple of specific questions around uh, bots. But, yeah. Um, oh, there's one just come in. So here's a question about LLP um, with EAM implementations, and if we just handle integrations or the the whole thing. So LLP Group, as I mentioned, is is ten companies. And um, we do operate as, as one you know, single unit, but we're distributed across um, the map and we're distributed across a portfolio of N4 uh, specialization. So one of our major ones is EAM. Um, as I mentioned, we're involved with uh, developing uh, go-to-market strategy for fleet management for EAM, but we also do facility management and and all of the other um, real uses of EAM. 
So that customer that I mentioned in the beginning is actually major EAM rollout, and um, we are the primary on that work. Uh, so yes, we do EAM, Sun Systems, DEPM, Burst. Um, uh, I'm going to leave things out. We, like I said, we have our own SaaS products as well that integrate with M4 applications. Um, but yeah, those that whole implementation is uh, LLP Group. We also do, um, you know, in the beginning, and let me see if I can easily switch back to that before, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, let's get this slide back up here. So, you know, there's a, a pretty good collection of cloud suites. And of course, they're based on N4 applications combined together into a suite, and then they're um, sitting on top of N4OS. And where uh, my team comes in really useful is that a lot of times we will actually partner with another partner. For example, um, what's something we, we don't do a lot of? Uh, retail, right? We do retail, obviously. Our, our last scenario was at the end there. But, um, you know, we can come in and support the OS and integration side uh, if there is another opportunity where um, working with Cloud Suite Retail is really somebody else's specialty. And that gives us sort of a wide reach across many industries and really many um, products to be able to support uh, the OS and really the core part of that implementation, um, even if that particular, the product set in that Cloud Suite isn't one of our specialties. Uh, we do you know, like I said, team up with other partners, but we cover a wide selection of these um, uh, for sure. So we're gonna run out of time here um, pretty soon. Uh, I think, you know, as I said, we'll, we will follow up with you that uh, have unanswered questions at this point. And uh, at this point, David, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for attendance. Uh, I'm just showing the last slide uh, where the contacts, if you're gonna have any kind of question. And I think we are same as uh, for all the uh, previous uh, sessions. We're gonna send all the attendees the recording uh, so you can basically run through once again. And truly, if there's gonna be anything, any more questions, feel free to contact to us and we will try to answer all of that. So thank you very much and have a nice day.